Okay, so you've written your list, you've got someone to play. It's now turn one and you're in the first phase of the game, which is the movement phase, which is possibly the most important phase in the game. As the name would suggest, it's the phase where you move your units around the board. Uh, it's the way you get into combat by charging. It's the way you get your units, uh, weapons, ranged weapons, magic attacks into range, or also how you get your units out of range of the, the enemy's uh, attacks. So this is a phase where you move your army about, really. So how far can you move? Well, in the profile of every model is the movement value. That's the M at the start. You can move that up to that amount in inches. So spearmen, elves, they're all movement five. They can move up to five inches. Units move um, directly forward. So these spearmen can move up to five inches directly forward. Other units like uh, this eagle here, although he's got movement two, he has the rule fly. Flyers can move a flat 10, in 10 inches. Every flyer can move 10 inches flat. So you use, if you choose to fly him, which means you can go over intervening terrain, you use the 10 inches. However, there's spells and effects, which means he's not able to fly, in which case you use the two inch move value. So there's a unit of spearmen. If I want to move them forward, their movement distance. Let's measure out five inches. And just move them forward. Eagle, probably be off the board here. Well, he can move up to 10 inches. So 10 inches is there. So I can move them. There's nine, so I can move them up to there. You don't have to go the full amount. You just can't go above that amount. So how do you get the unit to change direction? Well, you can either wheel them or reform them. So a wheel, it's probably easier to show you. If I want this unit to go that way, you pin that there so that model, that corner there doesn't move and you move from this corner up to the movement, the maximum movement value of the unit. So it's probably easier to show you. So if I want to turn this unit this way, you can move up to five. So I measure from this model here, five inches. So it takes three inches to get to there. So I've got another two left. So two inches gets me to there. So that's a wheel. So the, all the models are considered to have moved the same distance as the outside model, the model that moved the furthest. So even though this guy hasn't really moved at all, he still counts as moving five inches. The whole unit is counted as moving the same distance as this model here. So you are not limited to just one wheel either. So if you want to get out the way of something, you can say come forward two inches, wheel two inches, and then go forward your last inch there. So that's his five inch movement. The other way to get a unit to change direction is to reform it. A reform is just re reordering the unit on the center model. So that would be that guy there. So when you reform, you can add more models to the individual ranks. It's illegal. Um, you can take them away and add depth. So if you wanted to, you could take these ones off and put them in the back. You wouldn't do that with VSB, but just for example. Um, or you don't have to do any of that. You can just make the unit turn to, complete, to face a completely different direction. So if I wanted to reform to so that eagle, I was worried about that eagle. If I wanted to reform that unit to look at the eagle, to reform it on the center model, and it looks that way now. If you reform, you can't then make any further moves unless you have got a musician in the unit, which this has. So a swift reform, 
something the musician allows you to do. So he's there. If I want to reform to look at that and still move, you make the reform. Look at them, and then you take a leadership test to see if you can make a normal move afterwards. Leadership of those elves is eight, so that's an eight, so they can move now. So they could, if they wanted to, move closer to that eel. You can't ever come within one inch of any other units or things like impassable terrain. The only different exception for that is if you've charged, which we'll come on to, you do have to touch the uh, the opposing unit, so you can get within an inch there. Units can also move backwards, but it's more difficult for them. So they move backwards at half speed, rounding up. So these elves are movement five. So half of that's two and a half inches, rounded up to three. So they can move back like that. They can also move side to side. Again, it's half movement, rounding up. So they can move three inches that way, like that. You can't mix moving backwards, moving forwards, and moving side to side. If you move backwards, that's all you can do. If you move sideways, that's all you can do. You can't wheel backwards either. Um, so you've just got to go directly straight backwards. And you couldn't move back three and then think, oh, I've got two inches left, so I'll wheel like that. You're committed, you can only move backwards. That's all you can do. Single models um, follow all those kinds of um, movement rules, but there's something different about them. Um, if it's a single model, either by design like the eagle, or the entire unit's destroyed apart from one guy, he becomes a, a single model. Single models are permitted to pivot on the spot before they move an unlimited amount of times, and that doesn't cost any movement. So if he wants to get round this eagle, He can pivot like that, doesn't cost him anything. Move four up to there, pivot like that. And then move his last one. The, the situation where that doesn't apply is if it charges. You can't pivot to um, charge, you've got to wheel. But we'll come on to that. Okay, so the movement phase is broken up into three sub-phases, which is the charge phase, the compulsory moves, and the remaining moves. Charge phase comes first. Um, charging is the main way that units will get into um, combat. To fight an enemy unit, you must declare a charge in it. You can't just move into them. You've got to declare a charge into them and then successfully complete the charge before you can fight them. Um, so who can charge? Well, um, to declare a charge, it must be possible to make the charge. So you can't declare a charge if the enemy, enemy unit is too far away for the charge to actually be possible. And the distance to make a charge is your movement value plus um, the roll of two d6, two dice. So they're movement five. So if you want to declare a charge and find out if I can hit them, it's movement five plus whatever the result of this dice roll is. Which is uh, an 11, that's uh, a long charge. So that would be in, that would be possible. If they were, uh, let's have a look. So the highest you can roll is a 12. So if they are 18 inches away, they could never declare that charge because there's no way you can roll a 13 on two dice. And um, the other thing is um, the target unit must be visible, it must have line of sight from one model in the unit that wants to charge, and the target unit must be at least partially in the front arc of the unit that wants to charge. You'll often hear that referred to as a unit's charge arc. It's gotta be within that. So the process for declaring charges is, you choose a unit that wants to declare a charge, Spearman, 
and you say what unit you want the unit to charge. So they want you charge the clan rats over there. The unit being charged then gets to make a reaction. So they can either hold, where they do nothing and just uh, take the charge. If they've got um, ranged weapons, they can stand and shoot. The thing about stand and shoot is you can only do it if the unit that's charging is further away than their basic move value. So, for example, so for example, if they had ranged weapons, these are movement five. So, because they are further than five inches away from the unit that wants to stand and shoot, they can do it. But if they were there, they are now only three inches away from the unit that wants to stand and shoot. They don't have time to ready the weapons and fire because they are too close. They're within their movement value. So this unit can't stand and shoot. The other option is if they don't like the fight, they don't think they're going to win, you can flee. And to resolve a flee, you just turn the fleeing unit around so that it's center of that unit is directly going away from the center of the charging unit. You roll two dice. That's a double one. And then you just move them away, the result of that dice. So let's go through those options then. So, Spearman are gonna declare a charge against the clan rats. If they hold, and there's no other charges to make, which there isn't for this example, that's pretty straightforward. Normally you would measure the charge distance before you made it because that influences whether or not you think you can complete the charge. This is just over nine inches. So it's a 10 inch charge. Uh, they're movement five. So I need to roll five on this dice. It's cocked. Five, exactly in. So they would just go in like that. If you roll enough to get into the unit you want to charge, great. If you don't roll enough, that becomes a failed charge. So say that failed. So what happens in that case is the charging unit moves directly towards the unit it wanted to charge, the higher of the two dice rolled. Okay, so let's have a look at stand and shoot. So again, the spearmen are gonna charge the, we'll say the slaves with the slings. Um, let's just check the distance. So yeah, they're outside of five inches. That's their move. So they're out of their move allowance. So they can stand and shoot. I'll cover it more in the shooting phase, but two ranks can shoot. So there's 10. There is a negative one penalty to hit for standing and shooting. So I think these are ballistic skill two, which means they hit on fives normally. So it'll be sixes with the minus one for standing and shooting. So they fluffed all of that. So no six is there, so nothing happens. Standing and shooting can cause panic tests um, if the amount of damage that the standing and shooting does brings this unit, the charging unit, down. If it kills 25% of the unit off, then it will have to take a panic test as normal, which can interrupt the charge. So if you, so that's passed the panic test. If you fail it, they then panic and follow the rules of panic, which I'll cover in the psychology episode. Once the stand and shooting is completed, if, um, if they didn't do any wounds or didn't do enough wounds to cause a panic test or they passed the panic test, you then just roll charge distance. Three, so five plus three is eight. 
So yeah, there. So the last one to look at is Flea. So so again, Spearman make a charge against the Clan Rats. The Clan Rats don't fancy it, don't think they can win. They can flee to try to get away. All that happens then is Clan Rat player rolls two dice. So that's a 10. Turns the unit around on the center so that the center of the unit is directly away from the center of the charging unit. And then just move them forward 10 inches. So that's increased this charge distance now. So it's now a 12 inch charge. So they are movement five. So they need a seven to get to catch them. So they have, so that's a nine. So in this situation, you complete the charge and when you touch a fleeing unit like that, fleeing unit is destroyed. They can then take a leadership test to reform and look any way they want. What's that? Four, so yeah, so they can reform on the center look any way they want. Supposing that they'd not rolled enough, they'd roll that, that would be a failed charge. And they just move towards the unit that's fled and move the highest of the two dice, two inches. So that's straightforward, lined up um, charges. So what happens if, in this situation, where the spearmen want to charge the clan rats? Well, when you charge, you do move forward in a straight line, but you're permitted to make one wheel of up to 90 degrees along the charge. So check if it's a legal charge. Are they within 2d6 plus five of the clan rats? Yes, they are. That is a eight inch charge. Are they within the charge arc? Well, yep, they are, because they fall within the front arc of this unit. So I'll roll that up. So eight inch charge, they need to roll a three or more to get into there. So that's a nine. You have to maximize the amount of models that are in combat when you charge. So it would move forward, wheel up to 90 degrees, and complete the charge like that. As you can only make one wheel when you're moving the charge. This might be, supposing it's already made a wheel like that and then comes in and makes contact like that. Well, that's not going to work because there's only two models uh, in contact. So once you've made contact with the enemy unit, you can make an unlimited free wheel to maximize the amount of models in combat and to get the two models, uh, the, the, and to get the two units aligned. So you just move them in like that. Speaking of alignment, if for whatever reason that you can't complete the wheel to align with the charging unit, say for example, there's another unit in the way like that. So they now can't wheel past him um, to align with that. In situations like that, it's the unit being charged has to align to the charging unit. So we just close the door like that. Then they're aligned. So I said before, um, a charge has to be possible. So in this example, there's an eagle in the way of this unit here. So that unit wants to charge that one. It is possible to make this charge as long as this eagle charges either this unit or something else to get out of the way of this. So we'll pretend these reavers are working for the Skaven for some reason. So this charge here would be possible if he declares a charge. He doesn't declare a charge, it's not possible. So on the basis that you declare a charge with him first, I want to charge the clan rats, I want to charge the reavers, say so he's charging the reavers, their charge will be possible, so you can declare it. 
So the way it works is um, you select a unit, declare a charge. So I'm selecting the eagle. I'll declare a charge on those weavers. They'll make a reaction, hold, go on to your next unit, spearman. They'll make a declare a charge on the clan rats. They get to make their reaction, hold. Keep doing that along the line until everything is declared a charge and everything has made a reaction. And then when you have completed all that, then you start rolling the charges. And it's up to you what order you roll them in. But for this one, you want to do the eagle first, otherwise they'll fail. So eagle. The eagles fly, so they move 10 basic. So 10 plus 6, 16. They're well within range of those weavers, so they go off like that. These ones. That is just over six. So it's a seven inch charge. They can't actually fail that even on a double one. There's six. So in some cases you actually wheel away from them to bring them in. So when they hit the unit and they align. That's how you make that charge. What if Two or more units want to charge the same enemy unit. Well, that's not a problem. Same way as any as the rest of the charges, declare a charge. So these Reavers here, they're going to make a declare a charge against the clan rats. They decide to hold. I find a lot of people just put dice next to charging units just to um, help remind that they've declared. So the spearmen, they're going to make declare a charge against the clan rats as well. They'll decide to hold. Declare any more charges that you want. And then when it comes to this charge, you roll them both together. So they're going to be in because they're movement 9 plus 11. That's 20. That's plenty. Then roll these. So that's 7. So they're going to be in. And then you move them so that they are maximized to get the most number of models in from both units fighting like that and then like that what happens if the target you want to charge runs away well Say these clan rats want to charge the Reavers. I will declare a flea from them. You'll notice I'm using three dice for anything to do with horses. They have a rule called Swift Stride, which means that they roll three dice and remove the lowest for things like charge distances, fleeing, things like that. So they're going away 11 inches. Center to center. Right, so they can either try to continue the charge and catch them, or if they think it's too far away, there's a, if there's another valid target in the front arc, they can make a leadership test to change the target to something else. So, I can't remember off the top of my head what a clan rat's leadership is, but we'll say with the extra ranks it's seven. So they may have to make a leadership test on a seven, so that's an eight. So they can't do that. So they've got to complete the charge as normal. Movement five, so that's 13. So yeah, they would uh, make that charge and catch them. If they pass that leadership test, they can then change the target to this one. Same thing happens, they make a reaction, hold or flee, so they've got no ranged weapons, then try to complete the charge. So we'll say hold to six, they're going to be in. So how do you determine what part of the target unit that your charging units go into? Well, it's all based on the target units facing. So these spearmen are in the clan rats front arc coming off there. So these must make contact with the front arc of this unit when they charge. 
the reavers are in the flank of the clan rats. So when they charge, they must make contact with the flank of the clan rats. This can get a bit tricky when, say that there, the arc line goes through the unit. And in this situation, whichever side has the most models of the charging unit on, it counts as that flank. So if this line, this is five spearmen wide. If this line was to go through here and there was three spearmen in the front arc and two spearmen in the side arc, it's counted as a front charge. So they do their wheel, make contact, close the door. If for some reason you're not able to make contact with the correct facing, you can't make the charge. You don't switch to another facing that you can hit. Uh, you must go into the arc as determined by where you are in relation to the unit. Okay, then say, for example, all these units want to charge the clan rats. Um, as you can tell, there is not enough space to get all these in to that frontage. So what happens there? Well, you make the dice rolls as normal. Say they want to hold so that the archers, they're going to be in because they're movement 10. The reavers, they're in. And the spearmen, yep, they're in. So if it's clear you're not going to get them all in, it's for the owning player of the charging unit to decide which units complete the charge. So say I want the reavers to do it, and I want the so I want the reavers to do it, and I want the spearmen to do it. So forward wheel maximize. Oh. Just go straight forward. Oh. I might just about that. Uh, and these just count as a failed charge. So whatever they rolled got the highest amount because they can't get in now because the front arc is completely blocked. What happens if you charge a fleeing unit? They just flee again. So these reavers want to uh, charge these clan rats. The only reaction they can make if they're fleeing is to flee again. So they again, they go six inches away from the center of the new charging unit. If you charge a unit that flees off the edge of the battlefield, which that would, it counts as destroyed and it doesn't come back. All right, so let's have a look at uh, a few of these situations put together. So it's my turn, charge phase. So my first charge, because it can be in any order, those spearmen are going to charge those clan rats. So their reaction, hold. Next unit, I'm going to say the reavers, they're also going to charge those clan rats. And they're going to hold. The archers, probably their only legal charge would be into the clan rats. So look. Closest point to closest point. Yeah, so that's going to be a 14 inch charge. So that's a nine they would need. Let's have a look what else they would get. I mean, you can measure, pre measure any time. So that's an 18 to get to the rat ogres. They can't do that because that is a, um, they'd have to roll a 13 on two dice, which they can't do. So what about these clan rats over here? So that is a 16. Well, 17, just over 16. So they need a double six. The reavers are in the way. But remember, assuming they make that charge, that becomes possible. So they're going to make a charge on them. And they'll hold. So 
They're charging. They're charging. They're charging. The Eagle as well. He's in the flank of the Rat Ogres. So he is going to make a charge against them. Because he's got fly, he flies over intervening terrain and units. So that charge is possible. So let's see what he needs. So that's about 16 inch charge. The spearmen need right, closest point to closest point. That's a 12 inch charge. So they need a seven. They need a double six. The reavers to hit the flank of the clan rats. That's a 15. So they need a 6. So let's see, you can do them in any order, but I'm going to do these first because if they make their unlikely double six charge, they have to be out of the way. Nine, yep, so they're in. But because I've also declared a charge with these, I have to roll this these two together so that is going to be a fail because I needed a seven so the reavers are in so they go forward make their wheel forward close the door these spearmen failed so they just go forward two inches. If you fail, um, you still have to wheel towards the enemy that you were trying to charge. So, and you do pay for the wheel at this point. So you'll wheel about an inch and go forward an inch. Next, I'll do the eagle. You need a six. So he's failed. So he goes forward two. And the archers need no double six. The path is now clear because the reavers have done their charge. No. So they will start to wheel towards their target, three inches. I'll stop there. So that's that charge resolved. Just a uh, quick point about charge reactions. Um, you get a charge reaction against every unit that charges you if it's a multi-charge. So if these three units want to charge, Spearman say they go first, so my reaction would be to hold. And I say the Eagle wants to charge them, might be hold. If it gets to here, and I realize these are in the flank, which is bad for that unit, at this point I can say, nope, from that reaction, I want to flee. So you then flee away from this unit. These still get to complete the charges uh, as normal, but I mean, there's a possibility that they flee out of the charge arc of the eagle, so his charge becomes a fail. Or if they don't, any of these can complete the charge against the clan rats and then that uh, they get wiped out. So let's have a look and see how that would go. So the spearmen are going to charge the clan rats who hold. The eagle is going to do the same thing. He's in the front arc. They say they're going to hold. And the archers declare charge. They say, no, we are going to flee. Two dice, that's 11, which would be 12 for Skaven, because they get plus one. So turn them away from the center of the unit they're fleeing from. And then they go 12 in 
inches. So now, They are going to be out of the arc of the eagle and they are going to be this angle, right? and they're going to be, what's this charge now, 18. So by fleeing, they've made this eagle and this unit of spearmen fail their charges. Because it's now impossible for them to catch them. So they move forward. Six. He is out of arc now. So. Four. And it all depends on whether these make their charge. So that is a 15 inch. Sorry. 16 inch charge. So that needs an uh, 11. Nope. So they fail. The advantage to that is a unit that has failed its charge can't shoot and it can't do any more movement. So it's stuck there until the next turn. So that's the advantage to flee. So to sum up charges, pick a unit, declare a charge with it. The target unit makes a reaction, resolve the reaction. Go to your next unit that wants to make a charge. Target unit makes a reaction. Keep going on all the way like that until all the charges reactions have been resolved and then continue doing that until all the charges have been resolved and the units are either in combat or they have failed their charge. And that's about it for charges. All right, so you've resolved all your charges. The next sub phase is the compulsory movement phase. This is usually um, rallying fleeing troops or moving fleeing troops if they fail to rally. There are others that happen after that, but it's usually things like steam tanks, um, hell pit of nations, things in individual army books which have their own rules, which will say takes place in the compulsory movement phase. But the main ones that we'll have a look at is uh, rallying your fleeing troops and um, moving them. So let's have a look. So we'll say these reavers are fleeing. Say they fled away from a charge earlier. No, you can't do that. Right. So say these reavers are fleeing. Unless they started fleeing earlier, say they fled away from a charge, um, you can make an attempt to rally them, which is a leadership test. So they are leadership eight. And... If they had a musician, it'd be plus one, but for this case, we'll say that they haven't. So I need to roll an eight or lower to stop them from continuing to flee. So that is a four. So what happens there is they don't flee anymore and they can make a one reform to face any way they like, uh, in any formation they like. So like that, for example. And that's it. They can't move anymore. They can't shoot anything. If they don't pass the test, then they continue to flee in the direction they're going. So there's a 12. They've failed the rally test. So they just go forward the amount rolled. They can make another attempt to rally in your next compulsory move phase of your next movement phase. So you make all the rally tests um, one after the other, your choice where to start. So we'll say the Spearman and the Reavers are fleeing in this case. So the Reavers, they pass, they roll under an eight. So we'll point them that way. Spear, Spearman, they fail. So they continue to go Six inches. What happens if a fleeing unit would go through another unit? Well, in this case, if it's a friendly unit, say the Reavers are fleeing and they fail the test, so they go 10. So move them forward. If they come within an inch of another unit, 
they go through them and then end up on the other side as long as there's an inch there must be an inch away from that unit there so they'd end up like that that can send them beyond the amount they've rolled but the whole unit has to be more than an inch away from the uh, the other unit the downside of this is this friendly unit now that it's been fled through has to take a panic test it's leadership eight yeah, it's fine. What happens if you flee through an enemy unit? Well, pretty similar. So they're going 10. That would make them in contact with that. So they go through the unit, ending an inch away from them, which again can take them further than they actually rolled. To represent this, uh, because they've gone through an enemy unit, everything here has to take a dangerous terrain test. Dangerous terrain test is you roll a dice for every model in the unit. Any ones, they take a wound with no armor saves. So there's one. One, so one of them dies. That is the same for impassable terrain, which will say this uh, plastic plant is representing impassable terrain. So, reviewers are fleeing, they go eight. It's impassable, fleeing units can go through impassable terrain, unlike uh, non-fleeing units. So eight would end up in the middle of it, so they go completely through it, and an inch away from the terrain, and all of them that go through the terrain take a dangerous terrain test. So three of them die. If you're fleeing, you don't take further panic tests, so they don't have to take another test there. That's about it for compulsory moves. Um, there are, as I say, other units, uh, models, and different army books that make their moves in the compulsory move phase. But the only two ones that come up all the time will be rallying your fleeing units, and if they don't rally, moving fleeing units. And that's it. Okay, so we've done charges, we've done compulsory moves. All that's left is the remaining moves, which is everything else. Like I said at the start, um, units can do wheels, they can do reforms, uh, they can move forward, they can move backwards half, uh, half movement, and they can move side to side half movement. It's all based on the movement value. <clears throat> Some... Um, Common one, so elf movement five. These have got the fly special rule, so flyers move ten. Um, flyers move ten inches. Cavalry there, they move nine. Some special rules that um, are common in the uh, the remaining moves phase. Fly special rule. He treats everything in the way as open terrain, so. If there's a unit in his way, he can fly over it. It doesn't uh, that doesn't interrupt his path. Flyers are assumed to start on the ground and land on the ground, so they can't hover above a unit or hover above impassable terrain. They can't land on impassable terrain either, but they treat everything in the way as uh, open terrain, so they can go over units, impassable terrain, enemy units. Makes them very handy. So I said at the start that um, the units move their, up to their movement value. That's true, but they can increase their movement by marching. Marching means that they um, move double their movement allowance. So elves move five normally, but if they march, they can then move 10. Exactly the same, move it with 10. They can use their march allowance to wheel. So again, that side doesn't move. This side, they're wheeling that way. So this is the model that moves. So wheel three inches, move forward to complete the 10 inch um, move there. This means you can do 
bigger wheels with the march allowance. So if you want to get around like that, wheel like that. So there's three inches. It takes up a six and then move the rest of it up. Flyers like they, these move 10 inches, so they can march 20 inches, double their movement. Which is way over here. Another common special rule in the movement phase is fast cavalry. So these reavers have got the fast cavalry rule. That means they can make uh, an unlimited amount of reforms, even if they march. Um, because if you remember, if you reform, if you swift reform, you can move up to your movement value. You can't march after you've swift reformed. But these guys can march and reform as much as they want. So the fast cavalry free reform lets you do things like this. So they ordinarily, if they weren't fast cavalry, they couldn't get through here because they can't fit through the gap and they can't get within an inch of any other unit as the uh, standard movement rules are but they can reform the free into a column like that so they effectively come through here not come within an inch of either unit because it's four inches apart when they get there they reform back into their original formation for free and then they continue to move. The only restriction on that is no model can move with its reforms more than the uh, maximum movement allowance, which on them will be 18 inches because it's nine inches base doubled for uh, marching. The thing to watch out for for marching is it's fine if there's no enemies about, but say that doom wheel is there. If they want to march, as there's an enemy within eight inches of the unit that wants to march, they have to take a leadership test to uh, continue to march. Leadership eight. So they pass that on a six, they can march, they can move up to 10. Fly is a base movement 10. Everything with a fly special rule can fly 10 inches. They can march as well. So the flying march is 20 inches. So these can go quite a distance. That's about it for the movement phase. So just to recap, you start with uh, the charge subphase, declare your charges and resolve them. Then you do your compulsory moves, which is test to rally fleeing troops and move ones that don't rally. And then you do your remaining moves, which is everything else. Just to move your, uh, so you can wheel your units, move them forward, move them backwards, uh, reform them. Certain rules like fast cavalry and fly get you uh, a lot more maneuverability. Now that's it. Then uh, the next phase is the magic phase.